tell me, uh, Leonor, some of the stories from from the days that you spent at this uh, Center for Male Sexual Dysfunction. First of all, what went on there? What happened there? Well, let's see. Patient would come in and would see the urologist first and uh, would be kind of a conventional medical interview. You know, how do you do? What's your problem? And uh, then the patient would be assigned to the workup. <laughs> the workup is sounds sort of like an off-Broadway play here. Mm-hmm. And the workup would consist of spending uh, one or maybe even two nights in the sleep lab with their penis hooked up to a uh, erection measuring device. Uh, and, you know, typically... Um, men have erections coincident with their rapid eye movement sleep phases. So maybe they have five or six erections during the night, even though they're unaware of these. And men come in, so they say, I, I'm not having erections, I'm impotent. And so, okay, the sleep lab might show that they were having erections at night. That meant that the equipment was working okay. And you'd show them this printout and so that would be a part of the part of the workup, or they might not have erections at night. That was a little harder to interpret because they might not have slept well. I mean, how many people are going to sleep well in a strange lab with their penis hooked up to something and this technician watching them all night? But that would be part of the workup. Then there'd be a lot of blood work, even though hmm. we weren't entirely sure what we were looking for at that time. And then they would have an interview with me, and that would be the the psychological. And uh, I would sit down with these guys who, you know, 99.5% of them had never seen a psychologist before, and <laughs> certainly not a woman who was going to ask them impertinent questions. I mean, so many guys would say to me, uh, I've never told this to anyone before. You know, I had thought of needle pointing that, you know, putting it on a pillow in the waiting room so that they'd kind of get ready for the idea that they were going to talk about things they'd never talked about before to anyone. But yes, everyone started out self-conscious, but I like to think I put them at ease. That was a revolutionary experience because they would say, well, you know why I'm here. I'm, I don't have erections or I'm impotent. And I would say, as if I was like really stupid, I would say, "Uh uh-huh, and and how is that a problem for you? Mm -hmm. How is that a problem? They would look at me like, no, I just told you, I don't have erections. Mm -hmm. Uh Uh-huh, and how how is that a problem for you? Well, I I would keep saying that until they would tell me more about the meaning that this experience had. Uh, well, it means I can't have sex. I can't make love. I can't go near my wife. It means my wife's going to leave me. It means I don't feel like a man. It means I'm about to kill myself. It means, you know, my life is over or whatever it meant. Mm -hmm. It usually was pretty intense. Some guys, bless them to this day, would say, gee, you know, I never thought about that before. (laughs) And I would say, well, Most people haven't, so let's think about it together. You know, why is it important for you to have erections? And so then they would talk about, well, I like the feeling. Uh, I like to be inside my wife. I like to come that way. I like to ejaculate. Or my wife likes it. Or she says she likes the other stuff, the fingers, the mouth. She likes this and that. But she says, you know, it's a really special feeling when you're inside me. I miss that. So then, you know, I would get something about intimacy and something about gender and something about communication, and I would understand uh, more. Sometimes guys would just clam up. I, I, you know, if you don't understand mm. why it's a problem, lady, <laughs> I can't tell you. Uh, that would happen from time to time. <laughs> and I would, you know, I, I play with them. You know, I'd say, well, it's not that I don't understand. It's that every man is different. So just tell me why it's important for you. But isn't that a huge hurdle that as a culture, we, especially when it comes to sexuality, or I don't know if it's more intense with men than women, if there's a gender stratification here, that we want to be normal on the way it is. Being normal is is a big part of uh, 20th century 
society, the word normal, you know, just a totally medicalized view of being good, you know, being good in other times and other places and being good consisted of other things, you know, killing the deer <laughs> or, or praying to God or giving alms to the poor or whatever it was. But we don't talk so much here about being good nowadays. It's all about being normal, psycho, psycho good. And uh, the assumption is that there is a sexual normal. I, I dispute this. I'm going to go down fighting on this one. I don't think there is such a thing. Of course, there's a statistical average. People say, well, I, I, Doc, you know, I just want to be normal. Okay, fine. Uh, what do you mean by normal? I had a, one guy answer this. Mm -hmm. He said, I just want to go into the bar and be able to sit on the stool with the other guys. Now, you may ask yourself, what on God's earth does that have to do with having erectile function? Mm -hmm. But it's this inner sense of masculinity that I'm a phony. If I can't get it up when I need to get it up, I'm a worthless man. And I can't go into a bar and hold my head up because they, they'll know. And even if they don't know, I'll know. I can't even be in the company of other men. Right. The, the tribe. That's right. It's like I give off some kind of aroma of, of fraudulence. Uh, this is terrible. This is spirit killing. This is soul destroying. Mm -hmm. See, I don't think this guy would have had trouble getting on the bar stool if he had erections once in a while 20 years ago. Mm he would have at least felt okay. Did you see differences? I mean, you, you, you told us really solid, you know, narrative here about what these men would say and mm -hmm. how they made sense of their lack of um, an erection and what it meant to them. Did you talk to their wives? Were they as, as stricken by this? What happened? The, the wives were much more diverse. Some of them would say the way the man said, I really miss intercourse. I liked it a lot. Uh, I, I could come that way, or whether I could or couldn't come that way, I liked the feeling, I felt close. Mm -hmm. But a surprising number of the women would not say that. They would say, I don't know what he is so hung up about here. I mean, this guy, if he wakes up in the morning and starts talking about his erectile failure and goes to bed at night, that's all I hear out of him. You think that he could give me a, a, a little massage? You think that he could hold me? You think he could learn how to do something other than just stick it in? So a lot of the women would be angry. Hmm. It was like he's going on and on about his pleasure, but not my pleasure. Or then, then there would be the ones who never asked. You know, and I would hmm. say, well, have you told him? And, and they would say, why should I tell him? He's supposed to know. Mm -hmm. People don't learn uh, about their own bodies, how to communicate what they want, why they want it. Mm -hmm. They think they can turn it on just in a second. There are so many, quote, mistakes. <laughs> uh, it's not so easy to talk about things. Nowadays, communication is sort of more about a little slower, <laughs> a little more to the left. Oh, that feels really good. You know, it's, it's rarely about, you know, when we have uh, a lot of tenderness and foreplay, I really feel like you care about me and I really feel respected and that makes me feel so close to you, then I get really turned on and really hot. I mean, who, who, who produces a paragraph like that? You know, what do you see on something like Sex in the City? More about, so what do you like? Oh, I, I like blowjobs. Well, that's, that's really informative. In retrospect, uh, Leonor, do you see a clear path from the 1980s when men could get maybe surgical rods implanted in their penis or give themselves an injection for an erection to the pill called Viagra today, the miracle cure, so to speak? Does it, does it now seem like a clear path? It seems like a clear path, but not without consideration of factors that you didn't mention, like the deregulation of the pharmaceutical industry. There were huge economic changes that happened in the 80s and the early 90s that made it profitable 
for companies to develop what they call lifestyle drugs. So the, um, the industry, because of advantages uh, that they were given by legislative changes, uh, made a pathway. So sex kind of was the poster child for forces that were going on independent of it. You can't boil it all down to a single thing. If I try, I'm going to sound like a jackass, and that would probably undermine all of the swell things I've already said. But, you know, we've had huge social changes and advertising out of control to to make the body a product to be sold and to create insecurity if you don't have the right kind and to shrink the diversity. And people say to you, you know, well, you can you can be the best you can be. I mean, Oprah's famous line, you know, be the best you can be. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean I should get breast implants so I can be the best I can be? And then perhaps maybe there's a certain sector of people who just say, to hack with it and turn their backs on it because it seems to require so much effort. Yes, I, I think they do, but they pay a price in self-esteem and in public face. They're ashamed. Uh, I, I'm, I know that's true. I talk to a lot of them. The sense of shame at not measuring up to a norm is it's one of the fundamental social structures. Unless they have another rhetorical place to stand. The way I, I have another place to stand, I stand on feminism. Mm -hmm. That gives me a rhetoric, it gives me an attitude, it gives me self-confidence, it gives me an explanation so that I can resist the blandishments of People magazine. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't have that. You know, we're minds and we're bodies, and it's so erotic to be with someone else's mind and to feel the comfort, the pleasure, and the acceptance that comes from somebody seeing your naked, your naked reality and kissing it all over. But if you've had all of these surgical things done and you've taken three drugs and you're experiencing the side effects and you're wondering how long it's going to last, are you really going to relax and feel your body being worshipped by somebody else? Well, you may not even feel like it is your body anymore. Yeah. You know, to me, it's making making love. There I go, giving away my 1960s orientation. It's about making love, not having sex. Perhaps it would be enlightening or at least relaxing or liberating to not have as a focus, you know, orgasm and the aftermath, but just kind of playing. Yes. And maybe even failing to have an orgasm, but not calling it failing, but just not having one. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because we haven't talked enough about orgasm. I think that the uh, s central focus on orgasm is a, is a colossal mistake. Mm -hmm. And that this is one of the ways that the culture betrays the potential of sex, I think. I think orgasm has become such a focus because you can count it. It's a score. It happened. If you have it, you're a success. Mm -hmm. uh, but I came of age before orgasm mattered to many women. Petting was really popular, necking and petting, and not to orgasm in my experience. I've talked to other women my age who say it was different from them, so let me not generalize here. Mm -hmm. But I know it is possible to spend years feeling really sexy, really turned on, enjoying myself thoroughly, never having intercourse, never having an orgasm, as I didn't know about them. And I wasn't missing them because I wasn't told that I wasn't doing the right thing. Like, I feel like, you know, some Native American wise woman, you know, telling a tale from 6,000 years ago. <laughs> I think the orgasm, which is what, a 10 second long thing, 12 second long thing, to work for hours to get the 12 second long thing? Don't you think that's a little stupid? Couldn't we like spend time with whole body pleasure? I don't know how I could feel more strongly about it. 
I mean, I, I'm jumping up and down in this chair right now, but you can't see me <laughs> waving my arms wildly. Uh, I think that we are creating an epidemic of insecurity about the body, and sex is one of the manifestations. So, I mean, I think we're all dreadfully insecure in this sort of lacking of a of community way, and we have to find our way to a new a new model of how to be with each other in relationship and in community, in larger community, and sex is a piece of that story. Tell me, we only have a couple of minutes left, uh, Leonore, tell me about a campaign that's close to your heart uh, and that you've dedicated a website to. Yes. Well, you know, so here I am thinking all of these revolutionary things and working in the urology department, and I can see that the way urologists and the medical model in general are dealing with sex is, I think, a, a disaster. So w when Viagra comes out, it's like, oh my God, this is, this is what I've been worrying about all these years. This is the medicalization. This is the pursuit of, the, of perfection in a very narrow way. And then they started saying, and where's the Viagra for women? And I just hit the ceiling. I thought to myself, who wants a Viagra for women? Who said that women should have a Viagra? Who said this would make a better world? How can we have so many sex drugs and no mandatory comprehensive sex education? If, if you, people are going to be sexuality consumers, then they need to know something about the subject or else they're going to be sheep, just led to the led to the pharmacy counter. So I started a campaign. I got some people together. We started a website. We wrote some books. We wrote a training manual. We've had conferences. We've testified at the FDA. Uh, the Food and, and Drug Administration. Right. Mm -hmm. When they uh, had dealt with their first a drug for female sexual dysfunction, a completely new concept that was invented to sound like erectile dysfunction. You know, there's, okay, so we've got Viagra. And where's the Viagra for women? Wait a minute, wait a minute. What is the Viagra for women for? Uh-oh, we need a disease. All right, so men have erectile dysfunction. What do women have? Well, we, as we've been talking about, women have a lot of complaints here. Well, let's just say female sexual dysfunction, and we won't be too specific about what that is. So when the first drug came up, it was said to be a drug for, listen to this one, hypoactive, what is it, <laughs> hypoactive sexual desire disorder, HSDD, hypoactive sexual desire disorder. That means you don't have enough sexual desire. The industry is then going to flood the airwaves and the print media with advertisements, so everybody will then think, oh, well, you know, I could use a little boost here. Who mm -hmm. couldn't use a little boost? And all kinds of unintended negative consequences will flow forth. This more subtle shift of the meaning of sex and the purpose of sex and do I feel okay about me, my body, my lust, my libido, my pleasure. Do I feel okay about that or do I need to work on it? Mm -hmm. Tell uh, us uh, the name of your website. Right. <laughs> Newviewcampaign.org. N-E-W-V-I-E-W-C-A-M-P-A-I-G-N.org. New View Campaign. Right. There's going to be drugs. There's going to be lots of drugs. How are we going to deal with them? That's the question. I'm energized by the fact that this is really important to me and that I think I'm making a persuasive case. And we'll see how it all turns out. The Ideas of Leonore Tiefer was produced by Mary O'Connell. Technical production, Dave Field. Associate producer, Liz Naj. The executive producer of Ideas is Bernie Lucht. I'm Paul Kennedy. To learn more about CBC Radio podcasts, please visit cbc.ca slash podcasting. Hi, I'm Jesse Brown. I'm the host of Search Engine, a new CBC radio show that is all about how the internet is changing politics and culture. It's not a gadget show. 
we don't really care much about technology so much as we care about the effect that technology is having on the world that we live in. All of the surprising and significant and funny stories that we bring you on Search Engine are about things that are happening right now. In the short time that we've been on the air, we've already become the CBC's most popular news podcast in the States. So come find out why. Subscribe to our podcast on CBC's podcasting page or through iTunes.